Well, good morning. Boy, those are some, those are some really exciting announcements. And uh, I, I just, I love seeing those baptisms. I, I love hearing about the projects that are taking place in Western Kentucky, the anti-human trafficking place in, in LaGrange, and really pumped up about Nelson County. Uh, how exciting is that to have another campus in the works now? So it's gonna be, it's gonna be great. So thank you for your generosity. Uh, isn't it fun to see how every time we get to December, we have a chance to dwell upon giving and receiving. It kind of goes hand in hand. So what I wanna do is I wanna start by taking you down memory lane, and I'm gonna read off some of the most popular Christmas gifts from years gone past, all right? Now, it might not have been that you got this gift at the very early stage of it, but maybe you've gotten a form of it at some point. So when I say the name of said product, you just give me a sigh or make some noise. Let me know that, oh, yes, you got that. All right, here we go. Uh, 1995, PlayStation. Okay, good, good. Uh, 1982, the Rubik's Cube. 1986, Pictionary. 2014, how many of you bought an Elsa doll for your daughter? All right, they, they probably still have it. It's tough to let it go. Uh, all right, let's move on from that. 1996, Tickle Me Elmo. Remember that one? 1999, Pokemon cards. 1965, rock 'em, sock 'em robots. That won't encourage violence among brothers, will it, right? 1970, the Nerf ball. We have some Nerf ball people out here? I had a basketball goal set up in my bedroom. I had a fishing net and I cut the bottom of it out. I would shoot Nerf basketballs constantly. I was going to play in the NBA, but God called me into the ministry, all right? There were other reasons I didn't make it to the NBA. Uh, how about 1963, the Easy Bake Oven? And then this one has had a lot of different forms. It came out actually in 1952, Mr. Potato Head, right? Oh, yes, yes, we, we love Mr. Potato Head. Now, when you think about these, th these different products, stories come to your mind and you think about giving, you think about receiving. And at Christmas, we're reminded that Jesus was and is the most important gift. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse 15 says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And it's talking about Jesus Christ. And we've been in this series to the full. And we've been talking about how we can walk through the chapter of 1 John and see all these different attributes of God. And it fills us up. This entire chapter is a description of Jesus. It uses the metaphor of the word, word, as his identifier. It says in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word. Now, you see, Jesus was there. He was involved with creation. You say, well, Dave, how, how, how do we know that? Well, there are several different verses that, that let us know that, but the most obvious is back at creation when it says, God the Father says, let us make man in our own image. And so Jesus was there uh, as the God the Father, God the Son, and then the Holy Spirit as God the Spirit. They were all there at creation. And here in the New Testament, the disciple John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, interchangeably goes back and forth from Jesus and word. And John writes his gospel and the first line of his book says, in the beginning, so that's a phrase that signifies a new era, the, the Messiah has come. So think of it this way, your, your Bible could be divided into three different sections, all right? In the Old Testament, Jesus is coming. It contains prophecies, it contains promises concerning the coming Messiah. In the New Testament, in the Gospels, the first four, four books, it, we see Jesus is here. That is the fulfillment of, of the Messiah that they have been waiting for. God is faithful. But, but then we see that Acts through Revelation is Jesus is coming again. And so we need to be faithful and we need to be ready for his return. And in a world that is full of inconsistencies and uncertainty, the Christmas season reminds us that God is full of faithfulness. 
And when everything around us seems unknown and unexpected, he is the one in whom we can trust. And so today what I wanna do is I just wanna divide our, our text, which is John chapter one, verses 10 through 14. I just wanna divide that short passage into two simple parts. And they'll be easy for you to remember, the gift and the giver. And that's what we typically think of in December. Well, let's begin with the gift. Now, we've established that the gift is Jesus Christ. God sent his one and only son to come to earth. He was humanity and divinity. He was tempted in every point that, that we're tempted. And yet Hebrews chapter four, verse 15 says that he still remained without sin. And while John the Baptist came to prepare the way of the Lord, Jesus came to show us the way to live and to inform us that he was and is the way. But look with me at our, our first verse in our text, John chapter one, verses 10 and 11. It says, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Now that last line there is a very sad statement. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Jesus was a Jewish man, and yet the Jewish community who had been on the lookout for the Messiah for hundreds of years, they did not receive him. They did not accept him. And so some rejected the gift. Now let me point out, by not accepting, you are rejecting. And it's very, very important for us to understand. It's not a do nothing proposition and you are automatically in. No, think of it like this. If you make no decision, it's a no decision. You can't be passive. You, you must be active. You must choose to accept Jesus. Uh, this has happened several times where a governor has pardoned a criminal, but if the criminal rejects the pardon, he's not free. He still is captive. You have a say in that. And let's imagine that you and I are close friends. I, I know you well, I know what you like, I know what you need. And at Christmas, I put a lot of time and energy into getting a gift for you. And it comes time and around Christmas Eve, I, I, I bring you this gift. I say, hey, here, here you go, here you go. And I, I, I know it's just gonna blow your mind. And you say, oh, thank you so much. Thank, oh, this looks great, thank you. I can't wait to open it. Why don't you open it now? Well, you know what, I'm, I'm getting ready to go eat with a friend but thank you so much. This, this means so much that you would do this. Then he kind of heads on out. And the next time you see him, you're like, hey, I look at you and I go, huh? Huh? What'd you think? Come on. What'd you think of it, right? Did you like it? And you look back at me and you go, well, I, I, I don't, oh, the gift. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I see it every day. I'm excited about it. Today, I think it's going to be the day. I just haven't opened it yet. And that goes on and on. And, and pretty soon, you look at that and you realize that when someone gives you a gift, you have a choice and it's whether to accept that gift or not. But if you just keep putting it off and never commit to opening it, then eventually you will have missed out on the value of the gift. A gift is only a gift when it is opened and received. Until then, it's merely an opportunity. And when it is opened and received is when it becomes a gift. And you may say, well, I, I, I didn't do anything to deserve this. I, I can't take this. A gift is not dependent on the worthiness of the recipient. The gift is dependent on the grace and the gener generosity of the giver. And day after day, some of you have refused God's offer of grace because you have other things that are more pressing that seem to be a higher priority you have to help me with this, but you have to help me with this, but but what could be more important than where you spend eternity? And yet you will willingly choose to walk past an unopened gift of grace day after day. And our lame excuse is to say, well, you know, I mean, we we all make mistakes. A mistake repeated more than once is a decision. It's a choice that you're making. John chapter one, verses 10 and 11 tells us that some rejected the gift, but it goes on in verse 12 and it says that some accepted the gift. And that's, that's really good news. 
all right? That some did believe. Now, look at this verse, verse 12. It begins with a transitional word, the word yet. So the contrast of all this was, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And I love that phrase, to those who believed in his name. You'll find that the more you read the book of Acts, you will discover that the name of Jesus is important. It is a dividing line. That's why when the apostles would get arrested and they would be beaten, the authorities did not tell them that they could not preach. But here's what they did say. You cannot preach in his name. Why? Because they knew there was power in his name. In the name of Jesus. Acts chapter four, verse 12 says, salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. We want his name to become famous, not ours. That's why Jesus said in Mark chapter nine, verse 41, he said, truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. And when you try to make his name famous, he receives glory and he is the one who deserves it. And he can get quite creative with how he pulls things off when you wanna give him glory. Some of you were at Southeast back a little over 20 years ago, right after 9-11. And as a church, we, we really wanted to do something to help. And I'll never forget the week after 9-11, we were in an elders meeting and we were talking about a special love offering. I mean, you just wanted to do something to help out. It just, it just pulled at your heart. And so we discussed taking a special love offering and we thought, hey, maybe we'll give it to the United Way to distribute or, or maybe the Red Cross because both of those are, are really good organizations. But just before that final decision was made, one of our elders, Jim Brown, interrupted and, and he spoke up. And Jim is a quiet man and he doesn't speak up a whole lot in elders meetings. And so everybody kind of leaned in to hear what it was that he wanted to say. He said, you know, with all the money that we will give as a church, shouldn't we try to do what the Bible says and make certain that we give it in the name of Jesus? And everything kind of changed. That was the hinge point in that meeting. And a few of us were acquainted with an organization up in New York, a Christian organization that we knew would do a great job stewarding those gifts. And, and we also knew that they would give those gifts in the name of Jesus. And that's what we decided to do. And so the very next week, just on one week's notice, we asked people to make a special love offering gift. And that weekend, our, our offering doubled and we were able to make a, just a huge impact on people there is, is many of you all emptied your jar during a time of incredible uncertainty in our country. And we partnered with this Christian organization that we trusted and they began talking with different people and talking to relatives of family members and hearing all sorts of stories and trying to vet different stories and talking to small business owners around Ground Zero who were receiving absolutely no help and were dying on the vine. And by the time government funds would come through to help the people out, they're, their stores and their restaurants would be long gone and closed. And the Christian group that we were partnering with in the midst of all this called church here and they asked one of our pastors to come up and help distribute some of this. And they said, you know what? I mean, it's, it's your all's money that you all have given. Why don't you come and, and be a part of hearing these stories and seeing the difference that your church is making? And it turned out that the New York Times, a, a reporter heard about what was going on and he followed our pastor around that went and along with that organization all day long. And he heard countless stories and, and he, he, he saw people crying and sharing their story. And then he saw a pastor write out a check from the money that you all had given time and time again and just encourage these people and talk about the Lord with them. And the next morning, the headlines on the front page of the New York Times said, at ground zero, gospel and giving. And usually in lengthy articles, the journalist will pull out one phrase from the article and they will put it in very large letters so that it just kind of jumps out on the page. It's called a pull quote. 
You know why? Because it, it pulls you into the article when you read that one line. Guess what phrase the New York Times used to jump out on the page to 1.2 million readers? On each check, a handwritten, Jesus loves you. It was picked up by over 50 major newspapers. Over 20 of them chose to put that phrase on their front page. Why did that happen? All because a soft-spoken Christian man wanted to make certain that the gifts were given in the name of Jesus so that he would receive the glory. What was it Kyle said last week? More of Jesus, less of us. And that article became a catalyst for dozens of other churches to get involved through serving and giving. You do realize that this month you will have opportunities to make his name famous. Maybe it's a prayer that you're asked to say at a, at a party at work. Maybe it's a party that you host at your home and what you say to those guests. Maybe it's something that you write in, in a personalized Christmas card to someone. Perhaps the easiest way to make Christmas all about Jesus is by inviting someone who maybe doesn't attend church or, or doesn't believe in Christ to, to one of this year's Christmas Eve services. We have convenient times at every single campus. And I promise you this, if you bring a guest with you, I promise you, Kyle is going to explain the gospel and your invitation will communicate value to that person. And that service will communicate that Jesus loves them. So step outside of your comfort zone and, and, and bring someone with you. Uh, people are open to that invitation at this time of year. Now, before we leave verse 12, we need to see what happens to those who believe and accept Jesus. So look at it in its entirety. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. So don't miss this. You can't automatically say that you are a child of God just because you are a person, because you're a human. Lots of times I think we, we like to say, well, yeah, you know, I, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm a child of God. I'm, uh, we're all children of God. Well, not so fast. The Bible says that we were all created in the image of God. But you don't become a child of God until you make that conscious choice, until you open that gift and you make that decision for yourself. The phrase to become children of God, that phrase to become means that Jesus gave you the right. He gave you the authority to become a child of God. He's saying if you've made that choice to receive Christ and, and turned your life over to him, then it's not up for debate. You, you are a part of his family. You have been adopted into his family. And what a feeling to be chosen to know that you are a full-fledged part of God's family. And we have so many people here at Southeast at all of our campuses who, who have been adopted or have chosen to adopt. And it's a great picture of, of what happens when you accept Christ. I was watching this, this past week. We have a family from church that just uh, adopted a, a young boy. And I watched a reel on Instagram uh, just in one minute that recapped the entire day. You talk about an exciting video to watch. And I just watched that and, and, and your heart is stirred. And when you receive and when you accept Jesus, you become a child of God. You are adopted into his family. You have the same rights and privileges as any other sibling. Romans chapter eight, verse 16, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Galatians chapter three, verses 26 and 27. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And if you haven't received Christ or you haven't accepted him, I hope, I hope that you will, maybe today. Last Sunday, a, a, a week ago, I, I was sitting right up here with Beth and we were worshiping after the sermon and during a song, we were watching baptisms, you remember it. And after a couple of baptisms, they were just so moving. And by eyes, I could just feel them tearing up. 
And I looked over at Beth and so were hers. I said, it never gets old, does it? She said, no, it doesn't. But if you think about it, it's kind of hard not to get emotional when you're watching an adoption ceremony. And that's what we're watching. Well, we've looked at the gift. Now let's spend the rest of our time looking at the giver. And in John chapter one, we're going to see that the reason that Jesus is called the word is because he is the physical embodiment of of God's word. And in John chapter one, verse 14, the, the verse begins by saying, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And that's what Christians celebrate at Christmas time, the incarnation that he left heaven for earth, that he left his throne for a feeding trough in a barn, that he left the hails of glory for the nails of Calvary. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The message paraphrases that and says, Jesus moved into the neighborhood. The rest of verse 14 says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. John says, we have seen his glory. They have witnessed God in the flesh. And Jesus' grace and truth are a direct reflection of God's description of himself way back in Exodus chapter 34. And Jesus is the same God that led the Israelites through the wilderness. And his character has not changed in all of those thousands of years. So what do we know about the giver? Well, he he left heaven and he, he came to earth. The word became flesh. That word became implies leaving what you once were to become something new. And that's what he did. Divinity became humanity. And that is a trade that no one would make. And so the giver was sacrificial. The giver was unselfish. A couple of summers ago, I I was out of town. I was at the home of of one of my best friends and a long ways away from here. And we're having dinner with the whole family. And he gets up after the meal and he says to me, he says, hey, I want want to show you something. Come, Come with me. I'm like, sure, let's let's see, what what do you got? And he takes me into his bedroom and he shows me a massage chair that is right there in his bedroom. He said, oh, he said, you cannot leave. You can't leave the house until you spend 15 minutes sitting in that massage chair. I said, dude, you don't need to twist my arm. I'm in, right? (laughs) And so I sat down in that for a few minutes and and, and when I woke back up, uh, (laughs) I looked at him and I said, I love your chair. And he was excited about it. And you could tell that he, he, he wanted me to enjoy it too. Well, fast forward a few months, that was in August. A day after Christmas, he calls me up and we, we talk regularly. But uh, after a couple minutes, he said, hey, he said, I just got notified on my phone. He said that uh, I've, I sent you a package. It's, it's right at your garage. And I said, oh, okay, well, thanks so much. He sends me books a lot of times and all. He said, and he said, I don't want you to back over it. I said, okay, okay. So I kept talking to him. I went up to the garage and when I opened the door to the garage, I see this humongous box truck with a lift on the back of it. And I said, you didn't. And he said, I did. I said, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, it's unbelievable. I look out and here's this massage chair coming down the lift. Beth is out there. She's pumped up. Sam is pumped up. I have to tell you, when I, when I walked out of my kitchen into the garage and I saw that truck while I was talking to him, I got a lump in my throat and I, I started to tear up. I cry when somebody gets baptized or if you give me a new massage chair, okay? <laughs> Those are the only times, right? I, I said, I, I just can't believe this. And finally, I, I, was, I, I was able to speak and I said, dude, I said, I, I, I can't accept it. He said, yes, you can. I said, okay. All right. All right. And the whole rest of the day, I just kept saying to my family, he is so generous. He is so generous. And my son said, well, well, I help too. And I said, oh, I said, I'm so sorry. I said, did you chip in on the cost? He said, no, I gave him your address. 
My thanks, Sam. Appreciate it. Uh, but that chair is the most popular chair in our house. People come over to Bible study. They walk in the front door. They walk right past me. They go to the chair, right? But that night when we first got it, I, I called him back again. We called him up, I think, every night for a week. We made videos of different family members, you know, <laughs> different family members sitting in, in the chair, and we'd send them videos that we were just so appreciative, and there was so much gratitude. The next time I went out to where he lives and flew out there, I saw him in person. I said, hey, I said, I, I cannot thank you enough for that. And I said, and by the way, I, I love your car. <laughs> no, I did not say that, all right? I thought it. Uh, the giver was sacrificial and unselfish. Verse 14 goes on to say, he is full of both grace and truth. A perfect balance of justice and mercy. And that's why Jesus came, because he knew that without the shedding of blood, there could be no sacrifice for sin. So on that first Christmas, he came to earth so that on the first Good Friday, he could pay for our penalty. And as preachers, we can be guilty of talking less about God's wrath and more about God's grace, less about his justice and more about his mercy. But make no mistake, he is not soft on sin, nor should you be. It's because of sin that he came to earth. He knew our predicament. We had no escape without him. He calls us to repent of our sin, to turn to him, to live for him. That's why he's full of grace and truth. But perhaps his greatest attribute is the fact that he is faithful. Every promise he has ever made, he has kept. He follows through. He says, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. The Bible says the one who calls you is faithful. He will do it. This past week, we lost a Southeast member, Lyle Hawkins, after a year and a half battle with ALS. He's 63 years old. Periodically, I, I would visit with him to try to lift his spirits, but every visit would result in me walking away inspired. And during the early months when I would visit him, since his diagnosis, he just, he just dove into scripture. And every time I would see him, he would have the word right there in front of him. He couldn't get enough of it until his hands and fingers stopped working. And so then he would listen to it. And eventually he couldn't speak. And so he, he had something here called a, a Dynavox. It was a, a virtual keyboard that sat in front of him. It would read scripture to him, but it was amazing because he could communicate with me. He could communicate with his family with his eyes. And he would look at a screen and we'd, he would spell out different words. He would look at a certain part of the screen and it would read his eye movement and he would pick out different letters and he could spell sentences to me. I referred to him as the fastest eyes in the West. To save time, he had some preset phrases that he could quickly say with just one glance at a key. It's kind of like a, a speed dial. Phrases like, thank you for coming over. Or another one, hanging in there like a hair in a biscuit. <laughs> or I love you too. Or if he was tired and needed a nap that afternoon, or if it was almost bedtime, he would look at the key and say, nighty night, sleep tight. And his faith was so strong and his quick wit and his sense of humor just deepened our friendship. And Beth and I saw him in the hospital last Sunday after church. And the ALS had just ravaged his body. His neck muscles were non-existent. And so his, his head was propped up and held in place in such a way so that it wouldn't fall over. He couldn't swallow he was weak, but he could still use his eyes to ask questions. And we were talking to Lyle and Phyllis and their daughters, and something came up in the conversation about my preaching. And as soon as my preaching was mentioned, Lyle looked at his device and it quickly said, nighty night, sleep tight. <laughs> <laughs> he still had a sense of humor. He still had his sense of joy. And last Sunday, he still believed. 
that God could heal him. And his family called me the next day and they said he's, he's rapidly declined and he's just fighting to stay awake. He won't sleep. He doesn't wanna close his eyes because he's fearful of dying. He doesn't wanna leave us. He, he, he would like to talk with you. And his daughter, Ariel, put her phone on speaker and said, he's, he's working on a sentence to say to you. And pretty soon the voice said, I am not a good person. And I've seen this so many times, y'all. One of Satan's last ditch efforts is to attack Christians with fear and doubts. I see it all the time. And I said, you know, Lyle, we've, we have talked about this so much. You have repented of your sins. I said, you, you say that you're not good. I, I said, I'm, I'm not good either. That's why Jesus came to earth. I said, and throughout your adversity, you have been so faithful to God. And I said, I promise you, I assure you, he will be faithful to you. He will keep his promises. I was trying to convey to him that while at times the recipient of the gift is faithless, that doesn't change the fact that the giver of the gift is faithful. And I said, Lyle, before I pray with you, let me just remind you of some of the things that God has promised to you. And I said, I just, I just wanna read some of these verses to you and you just listen to them. And so I turned to John, all of the things that John has written, some of the things we've been studying. And this is what I reminded him of and Maybe you need to be reminded of it today yourself. John chapter one, verse 12, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. First John chapter one, verse nine, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from, from all unrighteousness. First John five, five, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God. 1 John 5, 11 and 12, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. This life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. And I said, and Lyle, just in case you're still not convinced, John writes, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And I said, Lyle, John chose the strongest possible word for so that you may know you have eternal life. He said, I said, it's the strongest possible word he could have chosen. I said, it was a courtroom term. It, it actually meant that the evidence is so irrefutable. It is so strong that it cannot be denied. It's overwhelming. And Lyle used his computer to thank me for reading those verses. His family said he was greatly comforted but promises from a faithful God have a way of doing that. And about an hour later, Lyle closed his eyes and went nighty night and awakened in the presence of the one who has kept every promise that he has ever made. Sometimes God chooses to heal someone. Other times he chooses to make them perfect by taking them to their eternal home with him you see, Jesus didn't come for people who think they're good. He came for those who admit that they're bad and they are in desperate need of a savior. That's me. That's all of us. Can I give you one more verse that John also recorded for us? John chapter three, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. And God is offering to adopt you into his family with all of the rights and privileges. And I've got news for you. He has already signed the paperwork with his own blood. You just need to open that gift. You just need to accept him and receive him. For God so loved the world that's Bethlehem, that he gave his one and only son, that's Calvary, that whoever believes in him will not perish, that's salvation, 
but have eternal life. That's heaven. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I hope that there are people listening to my voice who who desire to leave what they once were, to become something new. And I pray today, Lord, that they will accept both the gift and the giver, and that they will make that choice personal, and that they will put up the surrender flag and say, okay, Lord, today's the day. I'll stop walking past the unopened gift, and today I will receive it. Lord, help us to step out in faith and make commitments like that. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. I want you to know, um, I want you to know that you, you don't have to leave here today without making certain that you have received that gift. And uh, Satan will do anything he possibly can. I, I shared one small example of how he tries to attack Christians when they're at a a point in their life that he knows that's his last chance with them. And he knows he's already lost the battle. And so he wants to convince us that, that God really isn't faithful. But the truth of the matter is that he is. And all you have to do is look at a cross. You see, we see his faithfulness in the fact that he stayed on the cross when he could have come down from the cross. We see his faithfulness when he would leave heaven, a perfect place, and he left for only one reason. He, he, he left for you. The Bible tells us in, in Hebrews, it says, for the joy set before him. What, what was the joy that was set before Jesus? I mean, he had everything. What, what else could he need to bring him joy? I mean, he had a throne. He had a perfect paradise. He was right there in company with God the Father and God the Spirit. I mean, what more did he did he need? What didn't he have? The only thing he didn't have was you. And so he came from heaven to earth to get you, to grab your heart and for your heart to say, okay, Lord, I am imperfect and I I commit my life to you because you're the only hope that I can have. So if you want to find out more about opening that gift up, there's some, some people that are gonna be in here in our next step area down here on this first level on, on your left-hand side. And they just like to talk to people and guide them on what that journey might look like. They don't have all the answers, none of us do, but they know who does. And in the next song or two, or if after this service is over, you felt the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart, I just would say to you, don't let this day pass. Have a short visit conversation with the Lord and open that gift. Let's stand and let's continue to worship.